So I'm trying out something a little new, newer. Um, two different versions of the same video. I've had some people say they'd love to hear no commentary and some people like to hear me chatter. So I'll try to put both up within a day or two of each other and you can link back and forth at the beginning of the videos. See how that goes for a while. So this uh, project is some more of the willow wood I've been working on. I discovered a bunch of this at the bottom of my wood pile and it's the right size and it's almost completely cured. Gotta look out for the massive cracks though. I'm certainly not willing to risk injury with these. Um, bigger cracks okay, as long as it doesn't go all the way through the wood. And as long as you've got your tail stock up, you can usually support a piece of wood pretty well. And the other reason I'm okay with it is the um, by the time I'm st simply using a clamp on one side. Uh, it's already been through the resin treatment, making the whole thing very stable. I've yet to have a piece come apart when I've soaked it in resin using the pressure pot and the uh, vacuum chamber. Um, so, haven't been too concerned about it, but that being said, I always use a mask, a full-on head shield, and I always use a respirator level uh, lung protection. Not worth finding out when I'm 60 that some of this sawdust or resin dust caused lung cancer. <laughs> so. Another thank you to Lori Barber um, Mortens, Martinson. She she donated uh, a bunch of macaw feathers that I used for the Phoenix flyby vase, and I still had a bunch left. And there were so many problems with that previous vase, I decided to give it another try. I um, I'm pretty convinced these feathers are cursed. <laughs> As you will see, there were some fairly big problems with this this one as well maybe the third time will be the charm but um, I don't know so I got to this stage and uh, discovered there was some pieces getting a little too loose you can see there's a fair bit of worm damage and rot in there quite frankly I'm looking for wood that has tons of character so I like stuff like that it often has some really cool color really cool color and um, interesting little defects and things and when you douse the whole thing in resin it often preserves those really interesting characters in the wood and it's become a favorite thing of mine and also the wood is free <laughs> so that's super helpful I like to put on display what happens to most pieces of wood. Rot, decay, worms, grubs. Um, I don't mind having that stuff displayed in my pieces. It gives it a bit more interest. For me, it's either a perfect piece of wood or let's make this thing as character filled as possible. On a side note, um, I live in Utah. We're currently on a trip to New York City. I have, we have a tradition to take our older kids on a trip once a year. And, and this is what we decided to do this year. 
So I'm currently sitting on a toilet in a hotel in New York City. <laughs> These macaw feathers are something else. Blues, yellows, greens, a uh, little bit of purple in there. All kinds of amazing colors on one bird. As always, I like to use these angle grinders uh, with, a, with a carving disc. It's the fastest, most controlled way I've found of carving large holes in, in wood. We're still having a lot of control. Um, I've tried all kinds of connections for angle grinders and they're either too aggressive or not aggressive enough. Or more importantly, they go dull extremely fast. And one of these uh, cutting discs lasts for hours, usually, if you're not too aggressive. And of course, these file sanders are indispensable. Tip, the tip of that thing's about the sizes, size of a finger, so you can get that in most tight corners. There's nothing I hate more than the sanding with my hand, so this really saves me a lot of trouble. Now, something I learned about feathers since the last time last time I worked on them, if you steam them, um, you can get them to be a little more flexible, a little easier to work with. Per my normal routine, I stole my wife's whatever, and this time it turned out to be her steamer. <laughs> I think this is meant for clothes. Um, to carefully steam clothes, you can take care of them and not apply too much heat. But uh, she is a generous soul and a strange man who lives in her garage messing with feathers from time to time. <laughs> I'm getting over a cold, so excuse the voice today. Not exactly clear. The form making process has really progressed for me. Uh, we're using this corrugated plastic. I have found out the hard way that you gotta rough it up or even super glue won't stick. So I use my angle grinder, kind of sand away the top layers of that. And then I'm just gluing it to the top and the bottom rim of the project. And then I cut these fins through the through the uh, layer, which allows me to overlap them and glue them down and take the shape of the 
of the project. The idea here is, of course, to minimize the amount of resin that's lost. So once I do this, put it in garbage bags and pack sand around it, it makes for a, a, almost a perfectly tight form that's customable, customized every time. I'm going to try to look for different types of sheeted plastic though because it's corrugated an unholy amount of resin does get in between the layers of that wasting that amount which doesn't seem much but when you're doing a, a project this size um, you know that's way too much wasted resin so we're getting close it's almost a perfect perfect substance it has to be pretty rigid <clears throat> otherwise the weight of the sand would collapse the walls into the windows I'm cutting but uh, it works pretty well. On this project, I use the Illumilite Amazing Deep Pour Resin. That's what my local wood shop had handy. I've been going through a lot of resin lately, and my typical sponsor is Total Boat with their Deep Fathom Resin and I just ran out, so this is what I used in a pinch, and I've had good luck with it. But I will say, something about this batch on this project was different. I've used it for big projects before, <clears throat> with walls this thick, <clears throat> and about the same volume. And for some reason, the resin when it set got too hot and cracked. So I'm not entirely sure why. All of the conditions were the same as projects I've used used it before. Same manufacturer, same brand, you know, everything. So I don't know why, but for some reason this one got super hot and cracked, which is something I thought I had controlled with the type of resins I'm using and the size of the, the thickness of the walls of the project. The only thing I can think of was this piece of wood was super porous. And so there was a lot more resin inside the wood after it run, run through the vacuum chamber than the pressure pot. So the total volume was pretty high. And that itself may have just triggered a, an extremely high exothermic reaction. Which is why I named it Troubled, Troubled Feather. <laughs> because I can't seem to work with feathers without having a ma master, massive massacre in my uh, shop although this one wasn't that bad it was just the cracks and I did have to go back and fill them later but I still you can still see them in the project so we'll chalk it up to more character and an interest that it wouldn't have had otherwise uh, a lot of my projects I'll discover things that were not planned that sometimes I feel guilty because they weren't intentional but uh, you know we'll claim the beauty however it shows up I guess that's one bit of art isn't it what makes art art? That's a question my wife and I have debated. And I don't really know. I suppose if it uh, elicits an, a reaction with somebody, good or bad, you've done something artistic. Now I usually try to protect my tenon after I've created it because that's the perfect center for the project. On this one I had to turn it again um, these bigger projects, you never know how much resin is going to settle into the walls of your project. It'll seem like it's there, but after you run it through your pressure pot, sometimes it continues to bubble and settle. And so I filled it up just a little too high, overestimated how much it would settle. And so I had to go back and return it, which is tricky because if you don't get it just perfect, um, by the time you're turning at the other end of the project, you might lose an inch or two one way or another and it completely destroy what you're doing. In this case, it turned out just fine, but um, that was a little disconcerting having to redo that. That's something I always try to avoid with this kind of project. So fortunately, uh, this project's already been sold. As always, I sell them 
to raise money for Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, these are the folks that fight child trafficking around the world. Uh, there's always great stories coming out of their office with new operations, new people found, new kids freed from sex trafficking rings. And so we're always trying to fund them the best we can. So thank you for the buyer to the buyer who bought this before I even finished recording my project. And uh, we're on a roll. I don't have a single project other than some paintings I've done that are even available. Um, but if you go to artforour.org, there are about 85 artists who are represented there, whether they're wood turners or woodworkers or painters or what have you. There's a lot of people who donate some awesome stuff and would love to sell it to you, and a large portion of that always goes to Operation Underground Railroad. So thank you for your support on that. If there's nothing you can find at Art for OUR that interests you, some of the easy ways to help support in this fight is um, to use our Amazon link at Art for OUR to do your normal Amazon shopping. Uh, about 5% of your purchase goes to Operation Underground Railroad. You may be saying, well, I already do that with Operation Smile, or I'm sorry, um, Amazon Smile which is great, but we earn about 10 times more than that percentage-wise. And so if you really want to have your purchasing dollar at Amazon go the extra mile, um, use our link at Art for OUR anytime you do any Amazon shopping, and that helps a ton. You can also be a paid member, have a paid membership of this YouTube channel. Um, as always, I'm releasing several videos a month. Uh, Jody Fuller has joined us. She's an amazing charcoal and painting artist. And we've recently released her first project. And I think she'll be releasing a few a month as well. So we'll try to keep you entertained in return for your donations. So you'll notice some pretty big cracks are starting to appear here. And again, this happens when your resin is poured too deep, too thick. Um, it's a chemical reaction when you pour the two parts together. And if you do anything beyond the manufacturer's um, design, you'll have this exothermic reaction, which means it's incredibly hot or can be. And I've had cases where I went way too far and it will actually boil and it'd be completely unstable. In this case, it just cracked, which did add some interest. Um, it has kind of an aged, I don't know, aged stained glass look to it, which turned out pretty cool. Uh, this is what happened to my crystal tree project that I released a long time ago that has been one of my most popular ones ever. And so I've learned to just run with it, you know? Maybe it was meant to be. <laughs> Sometimes these little uh, hiccups turn out to be more interesting than the project I had initially planned, so I'm not above admitting that for sure. I've had a number of people say, Dan, you are way too hard on your work. And I, I always hope that people understand that, I don't know, maybe it's the critic in me, the, the cynic. I have no problem having self, a healthy amount of self-deprecating self humor. Um, and I like, to, I like to be realistic, too, when I fall short of my goals with a project. You know, I like to be honest and upfront with that. It's like playing basketball. If you hit a bank shot that wasn't your plan, you got to call it, right? <laughs> so anyway, I skip a, a, par, a big part of this project where I actually did the exact same process of putting it back in my... Uh, mold. This time I just had to use garbage bags because I didn't need the wall support of the corrugated plastic. But I put it in there, put the sand around it, poured in another, I don't know, not a whole lot, quart maybe of resin. And it really filled the cracks in nicely. Not perfectly though, still seam, but at least it stabilized some of these really big cracks a lot better. 
and I felt a lot better about the project. So it's nice to know that that process does work, even when I'm trying to fill little tiny cracks throughout a project where you can't just fill them because it's all the way around the projects. And if you try to do little dams and things, you'd be doing it 10 different times and ain't nobody got time for that. When I sand these, I usually go from 40 grit, if things are kind of on the rough side, um, up to about 2,000 grit. I'm kind of old school, I suppose. I still do the wet sanding, which uh, really helps me get a perfect finish. And then what really helps is doing an oil-based finish. I usually use teak oil and that really makes a shine come through and it makes it more translucent which is really hard to do with clear resin projects resin's hard to polish but when you're doing clear boy it brings out every defect and so you got to get it as perfect as it'll allow and as, as as far as my patience will allow and so that usually gets the job done i've tried different turning pastes and because of the nature of my work with cracks and different things, uh, I often find myself having to clean the cracks out from the paste. So it hasn't really turned out well for me, but I'm sure um, some of my projects would benefit better from that. I tried something different on this project I'm learning through trial and error, I've only been at this a couple of years, that if you rely completely on the chuck at the end of the bowl to provide your stability with these really tall projects where you're that far away from the supporting part of the where it's connected to the lathe, it's quite unstable if you get a catch, if you catch anything. And so on this one I experimented on leaving my tailstock there for a long time and just had a pillar of wood as, going there as far as I could because by the time you clean it out and you get rid of the weight um, the project isn't as formidable if you hit a hit something it doesn't buck as much and um, it's a lot more forgiving and I think I'll do this in the future because I, then I don't have to reset it on the chuck so many times and re Get, try to get it centered a million times, which will happen if, with these big old projects. And then you end up having to resurface every area. So um, usually I would use my um, drill bits, my Forstner bits, to just take out the whole center so I don't have to worry so much about, work on it so much with my turning. Uh, but I, I waited to the end to do that. And uh, I think it worked out pretty well. I, I'm going to keep trying this. And it seemed to be a lot st less stressful on my Forgener bits because I wasn't fighting all the wood around it. So, win-win. Well, at this point, I'll leave you to it. Um, thank you for watching this project and, and for your support. Um, sometimes it's incredible to see the support we get over at Art for OUR. Uh, we just did the books for the end of the month, and I believe we cracked $46,000 raised so far. So it's possible this month we'll hit the $50,000 mark, which is absolutely insane. Literally about 100 times more than I ever imagined. <laughs> so thank you for watching and sharing and subscribing. That does make up a big portion of the money we raise as viewership on YouTube, so that support is very appreciated. Anyway, have a great one. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot.